I did an interview about a month ago, I think it was, with Rob Rosen. He's an author. And after we were finished, I said, hey, Rob, who do you know that would make a great podcast guest? And he said, oh, you need to talk to Rick Reed. I've written a lot of books, but he's written over 50 of them. So Rick has done that, and his two genres are horror and gay romance. I'm kind of thinking maybe he's been watching my dating scene to put those two things together. Just kidding. Anyway, interesting story, interesting guy. Hope you like it. Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Rick Reed, who is a prolific writer. How many books have you written? I've kind of lost count. I know it's at least 50, wow. but it might be slightly more than that now. Anyway, say hi to my people. Hello, people. Glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here. One of your fellow authors said, oh, you got you to gotta interview Rick. He's, he's a good one. Yes, he's a, <laughs> so is Rob Rose. Right. What do you write about? Mostly these days I write about my bio. said at one point that I write about horror. I write about suspense. I write love stories, people in conflict, but it always comes back to the redemptive power of love. And mm. that's sort of the bottom line, even for my darker stuff. So you work in love on your horror stories? Oh, yes. Yes. That's an important part of, of every story I think I write. It doesn't have to necessarily be romantic love, but it, it, there's love in some form that usually will bring people together or will solve some sort of problem they're experiencing in their lives at that time. Why, why do you approach it that way? Um, gee, the thing about my writing is I don't, I, I'm very, um, I go very much with instinct. I'm a, very much a pantser, not a plotter. I write from the seat of my pants. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a general idea of right. where I'm going with a story, but I let the characters take me on their journey and probably writing a book for me is as much of a journey as it is for my readers. I don't have a lot of answers to the why questions. I can try to give you some psychological insight, but it's it's just when I sit down to write, it's sort of an act of self-hypnosis and the best stuff comes out when it's actually the, the easiest, when it's just flowing, like my fingers are just a conduit to maybe something more than my mind, but my heart as well. I was reading some of your materials and you said you don't often have writer's block, correct? I don't believe in writer's yeah. block. I think it's a lazy excuse. For, really? Forgive me if you're out there saying you experience writer's block, but I think probably greater writers than myself have said similar things about writer's block that you just need to, you just need to sit down and work. And it's, it's, how my my process works for me uh, you know I, I as i said i take a journey as much as the reader does so if you're actually writing something anything different things are going to occur to you as you go along right. um so but if you just say oh i have writer's block and you close the laptop or shut down the computer or close your notebooks and walk away from it you're never going to get anywhere but if you actually try and write and get something down then from those things, other things can occur. It may not be the best thing. It may not be your final draft, but you'll get something because right. the characters will make connections. There'll be conversations that will come to you. There will be turns of plot that will come to you. But those, those can't happen if you say, oh, I have writer's block I, right. and I just can't do it. Right. And you try to write every day or just weekdays or what? Uh, I pretty much stick to weekdays. I like to give myself the weekend. I think uh, my mind and my stories benefit from having no active thinking on whatever project I'm working on at the time. So I think there's a subconscious flow that goes on, and I think it's beneficial to take time off. So, But I do try to write every weekday, and I try to get through a thousand words roughly a day. So when you're approaching a new story, do you... Do you start with the characters or do you start with the storyline or is it kind of going back and forth? It's a little bit of both. I mean, I, 
you know, I don't just sit down and write with no idea what I'm going to write about. Um, right. I have a, a basic concept. I have characters that I want to use. But the, probably the most important thing is that I understand, get to know, and kind of fall in love with my characters because they become very real to me in my head and they will determine what direction things will take. So you kind of know them. Or you get to know them, your I characters, get to know them. and they're, then you put them in situations. They're very real to me. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so they kind of lead me on their journey. And, and sometimes they do things that I don't expect them to do. They take off in different directions. They'll say different things. They'll meet different people. Characters will pop up as I'm writing that when I sat down to write 20 minutes beforehand, I didn't even know I was going to write about. And then this right. fully formed man or woman will appear in the story uh, with a name and, and characteristics and a personality. And I didn't even know I was going to meet that person that day. So well, it almost sounds like you're channeling something from somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think yeah. there's probably some truth to that. Yeah, it's. It's something I don't like to question too. I don't want to be too eager about questioning right. where it comes from. Or too it's, closely. It's yeah. a little. It's a little. It's a little magic, right. if it doesn't sound pretentious to say that. Yeah. Well, something must be working if you've written that many. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I have probably more stories in my head than I'll ever actually get down before I hit the road and go to the other side. So, do you prefer the horror or the? I'll say a romance, which. Or do you not have a favorite? Um, I'm more inclined to write darker stuff. And I have written quite a few books that have been classified as romances, but I think of them more as love stories because romance generally has like very specific tropes and how it's going to go and how it has to end, where my stories often come they're often drawn, especially the love stories, are often drawn from my own life. So they don't have uh, necessarily, um, you know, some kind of person in distress which who's rescued by an alpha male or something. But um, now, are you are you gay? Yes. Are your characters primarily gay or not? Yes, they are. All of them. Not I mean, all the, the main ones. The main ones. Most of my books are about LGBTQ people in okay. general. There's only a few books. My first two books were straight horror novels that were published by Dell back in 19, early 90s. Then around 2007, I began writing pretty much exclusively gay characters, gay themes, gay stories, and, and stuff drawn from my, as I said, from my own life. Do you work with one publisher or do you have multiple ones? I have multiple ones and... Over the years, I've had multiple ones. There's two I work with now, mainly Nine Star Press and JMS Books. And I had, I won't go into like <laughs> some of the bad experiences I've had, but it's. Uh, Come on, we want the dirt. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. So let's talk a little about you. So you're gay. When did you figure that out? Figured that out. Well, figuring something out, being aware of it and accepting it are very different things. I mean, I probably had an awareness of being attracted to my own sex, you know, at a very young age, actually, probably as a child. But I didn't know what that meant. I just thought I grew up in a small town in eastern Ohio near Pittsburgh. You know, I didn't see many gay people. My mother's hairdresser is the one I remember. And, you know, I, I wasn't anything like him, so I didn't think I was gay, I, you know. And it was a, it, back then, it was quite a, you know, it was a horrible thing. You know, you were a victim of ridicule at best or, or a victim of, you know, uh, abuse at worst. So it was something I fled from and wanted to be quote unquote normal. And, uh, you know, I, I dated girls through high school. I fell in love with a woman in college and we got married after we graduated and we had a son. And on the surface, it all looked very good. But inside there was this turmoil. And I was, uh, I felt like I was wearing a mask all the time. And I, I felt like 
everyone who knew me didn't really know me. So when you have that feeling, you have these people in your life that care about you and love you. But then there's always in the back of your mind, if they knew who I really was, would they love me? So it it took me a while. I was in my early 30s. I'd been married seven years. I started seeing a therapist, and that's when I started to realize I needed to accept myself and in spite of the turmoil it caused, and it did cause a lot of turmoil. Um, so you, you got divorced? Yes. Uh-huh. And uh, How long did that process take? Probably a good couple of years and tens of thousands of dollars because we, um, well... <laughs> Another story. <laughs> it's, a long, like, it's a long yeah. story, but let's yeah. just say there was... Um, there were battles over custody and visitation, and and I loved my son very much, and he was six at the time, and I was not about to let them take him away from me, which is kind of what, what was being attempted at the time. So so she knew that you were getting a divorce, be, you wanted one because you were gay? She knew that part? Yes, yes. And did they try to throw that into the mix with, oh, a, yes. with a child? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. That I was like a danger to my son, which was ridiculous. I'd never been anything but loving. And it was mostly my my in-laws. Um, I'm getting very personal here. Yeah. It was mostly my in-laws pushing for this, for me not to be able to see my son at all, not even to have visitation. So I really had to fight. I had to spend every penny I had. And they did too. And it backfired eventually on my in-laws because my son grew up knowing what they tried to do right and he ended up hating them and as i mentioned i right. told you he he turned out to be gay too so right um well my listeners didn't hear that part but yeah we talked about that earlier so yeah i was involved with the gay fathers group in seattle for a long time and uh i've heard that story before but you know a lot often the the mother will turn try to turn the kids but eventually it comes back to bite him yeah a lot yeah. of times yeah and i don't take any happiness in that but um right. there is a kind of justice to it right but you said you get along with her now oh yeah yeah in fact she's probably one of the pe- few people that i love most in the world oh cool does she read your books you know what i i don't know part of me i think i'm pretty sure she's read a couple of them i know of but there's one in particular called Unraveling that is really my coming out story that came out a couple years ago. And, uh, and she's in it, of course, and my son is in it as a little boy. And it takes place around the time I came out. And so it's set in the late 1980s, early 1990s. I don't know how, I, you know, I wonder about her reading that. I gave it to my son and I said, read this and let me know if you think your mom would like it. Because... I made her an even more sympathetic character than she probably was in real right. life at the time. She was actually one of the most more mature characters in the book who was more understanding and 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 she's all those things but it was kind of condensed. And you're close to your your son? Yeah, yeah. And where I where's wish, he today? Well, he's in Vancouver, British Columbia. Okay. Um, he's a teacher and so is his husband. He grew up in Chicago, where we all lived at one point. When he went to college, he went to McGill University in Montreal, which is where he met his husband, and lived there for many years. His his husband was Quebecois, and they got married in Montreal, and they stayed there for a long time. And uh, as I mentioned, I lived in Seattle for quite some time, and I was always telling them, why don't you, if you want to stay in Canada, why don't you move to Vancouver, come over to the West Coast, then we can see you a lot more. Right. And, of course, as it turned out, they didn't move there until we moved down here to Palm Springs. But we do see each other at least once a year, and we keep in touch. And, yeah, we have a good relationship. So out of all of your books, do you have some favorites? Sure, I do. I mean, it's it's a, it's one of those questions. It's like, who's your favorite child? But, right. um, I mean, they all have a place in my heart and they all reflect a time of life I was in when I wrote them. But probably what I think are, um, how much time do we have? We have uh, plenty of time. <laughs> a few that I'm really, really proud of. The first one that comes to mind is the man 
from Milwaukee, which is about a closeted young man who becomes obsessed with Jeffrey Dahmer at the time of his arrest in 1991. And he begins writing to Dahmer in prison and getting this, getting letters back. And there's a correspondence. Mm-hmm. And his He's very closeted his, and alone, and it's 1991. He's taking care of his mother, who is dying from AIDS. and um, From a transfusion or something, yes, probably, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So he, he has this hatred for himself, which he conflates to Dahmer and thinks that the two of them have something in common, that Dahmer couldn't resist his impulses just like Emery, my main character and man from Milwaukee, can't resist his homosexual impulses, which he acts on very furtively and very secretly. And in the end, well, I don't want to go into what happens in the end. Don't give away the whole thing. <laughs> he, he, he meets someone that he uh, kind of falls for who's much more out and open, but yet he's still influenced by these dark letters that he's writing and receiving. And there's a twist in the book, and I won't say any more about it, but it's been very well received. It's um, coming out in, I think, next month in in an Italian edition, and it will debut at the Turin Book Fair, which is the biggest book fair in Italy. It's also been optioned for a uh, film, but we haven't gotten a uh, production deal yet. So, so one of the studios has an option on it? Or a uh, producer, did they just grab it? Producer. Right. Yeah. Okay. Independent producer. has and The screenplay is written. It's been sh- being shopped around. That's where it is now. Let me see the... One other book that I'm really proud of is called Raining Men, and it's it's pretty much a gay love story about a sex addict who um, who realizes uh, when his father dies that he has to find a way to uh, figure out who he is and why he is, and it's about his journey to finding love, and mainly it's about his journey to finding love for himself because his actions up until that point in his life made him a very hateful person. And I had him originally appear in another book called Chaser, and the two books can be read together. Chaser is about his best friend, but you see uh, the main character from Raining Men, Bobby, who betrays him left and right. And most people, when they read about Bobby and Chaser, had a very visceral reaction to him. They hated him. And one of the things that I'm most proud of in my whole writing career is that in Raining Men, I get, made re- him human. I right. get readers yeah. to understand Bobby, right. not only understand him, to love him and to root for him, even though he was this despicable person, but he, he finds his way. So I'm very proud of that one. And let's see, I, out of 50 books, the last one published was called The Impossible Childhood of My Desires. And it is about a gay couple who are in their 50s and uh, have been together for a long time. But one of them has a secret, and that is that he's always believed he's female on the inside. And he keeps that secret and waits for time alone. But in the back of his closet, he has a wig and he has dresses and makeup. And when he he knows he'll be alone, he indulges himself in, in his feminine identity. Well, one day, the book opens with a day when his husband comes home sick early from work, and he's all dressed, in, 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 cross-dressed. And, um, and it sends their marriage into, like, free fall, and the husband leaves and needs time to evaluate. And the thrust of the story is about my trans character coming into her own as a female, and also about the husband trying to understand, and is their love strong enough to survive this sea change that's that's a big thing. So the big question is, will they be able to stay together, or will there be some other way they can work things out, or will they completely go separate ways? What's the book that's on your your blog and well, and by the way you'll we'll put links to all how people can contact you and look up your stuff and all, and all that but but on the, what's what's it starts with a b you know blank blink blink mm-hmm. yeah that intrigued me in fact i'm probably gonna buy that oh. <laughs> um thank you uh you had a little synopsis there right? maybe it was on amazon or something i read it and it really it caught me well blink is another very, uh, very much autobiographical book. The first part of it takes place in Chicago, and this was all 
happening for me. I used to take the L to work every day and I would see this, and I was engaged to be married. And I would see this gorgeous Hispanic man on the train several times and we would make eye contact. And, and I was so closeted and so shy then. And I remember one time he smiled at me. And so this I, is real life we're talking This now. is real okay, life. Right, okay. and, and it's yeah. also in the book in Blink. The book, right. Okay. And there was one day he smiled at me and I thought he was laughing at me, of course. And then um, eventually I got off the train at his stop with him and we talked. And uh, even though I was engaged and even though it was wrong, I invited him to come over to my apartment that night. And he did. And we were, let's just say, getting very romantic. <laughs> okay. But the phone rang, and this was back in the days when there wasn't voicemail or right. answering machines or anything, so I had to interrupt things and get up and answer the phone. And it was Mom. Oh, brother. And Mom wanted to talk about the upcoming wedding and, and what how planning was going and everything. Wow. So that was real a real mood killer. And so I sent Carlos on his way and never saw him again. And that happens in the book. Life can change in the blink of an eye is sort of the right. tagline. And that's when life changed for me. So in the book, I portray that whole period in the 1980s. And then I go to um, present day. And the main character has been through a marriage. He has an adult son. But he's wondering, now with social media and everything, he's thinking about Carlos. Wonder where he is. What, what's ever happened to him? And we go into Carlos's story and what happened to him through the years. And we have the main character find him. And is it going to work out? Is it not? You know, after 30 years, is it going right. to is it going to happen? Are they going to find love for each other late in life? I won't answer that question. But um, that uh, Blink is another book I'm really proud of. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll be buying that one. By the way, I I personally searched for Carlos, but I never found him. Really? And so, which makes me wonder, is he still alive? Is right. he, um, you know, did, did he die somewhere along the way? Because I could find no trace of him on social media. Yeah. Did you know his last name? Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. did? Okay. I dedicated the book to him. Maybe someday he'll pop up. and That actually makes me sad. Well, in actually, in doing research for Unraveling, which I mentioned was sort of my coming out story, right. um, I made one of the characters, one of the first men I fell in love with, who was a black Irish Southside Chicago EMT. Um, mm -hmm. And we had a, a brief but passionate relationship. And uh, I never heard from him, but I went looking for him when I was writing the book and found that probably just a few years after we were together, he passed away Oh wow! in his late 20s, probably. So I think he probably had AIDS um, because back then, right. you know, there wouldn't have been the treatments. So you're married, but not to Carlos. Your not husband to Carlos. is Bruce, right? Bruce, yes. Yeah. Where'd we, you meet Bruce? We met online, um, actually. As How long you, ago? As you do these days. It will be, well, we were in June. It will be 21 years since we had our first date, which was what we used to celebrate. At, well, we still celebrate that as our anniversary, but now we have two anniversaries, which in December is our legally wed anniversary, which was 10 years ago now. It's really interesting because I have a lot of gay people on the podcast, of course, but so many of them have been in long-term relationships, which seems to go against what people think. You know, gay guys, well, they're so flaky and there was somebody a year or two, but a lot of them have been in long-term relationships. I've noticed that myself. Yeah. Um, and I used to think the same thing, but I kind of think from my own anecdotal experience that gay people marriages seem to last longer and people stay together more maybe because there's just more they're more accepting of each other and willing to go with change and flow i don't i you know i don't oh. presume to know but but i've noticed that what do you like about bruce he's my family he makes life for me wonderful he's unselfish he's caring he's generous he puts up with with stuff from me that not everyone would he's just a good partner in life and uh i can't imagine being with anyone else and you now live in palm springs cathedral city okay. actually which is palm oh, springs adjacent <laughs> yes yeah. um yeah. we started out when we moved here we lived in south palm springs we rented a house until we could get 
our footing and then we found the house we loved that was perfect for us and it was in cathedral city and you were in as i was you were in seattle before that yeah for almost 10 years and before that um briefly in miami and then before that 20 some years in chicago a lot of big gay cities that's what you have to do um i mean if you want to have a social life or meet people you kind of have to live in the bigger cities or What what do you like about this area Right now, I'm loving it. I mean, it's it's uh, perfect weather. I right. love to hike, and there's lots of hiking trails. Uh, I love to bike, and the scenery around here is, you can start to take it for granted, but it's just so stunning and beautiful. And I like, after having lived in Chicago and Seattle and those big cities and, and really having absorb big city life in a big way, both Bruce and I were ready for a slower pace, you know, not so many options, not so many headaches that you get from living in a big city. But Palm Springs still offers a, a lot in terms of culture and and good restaurants and, and performers. And it's a unique place. And it, it's also a very gay city for, right. uh, for its size, especially, I think, probably one of the most gay places. I, I, we were talking the other, I was talking to somebody the other day and it is like literally the gayest. If you, if you look at percentages, yes, but per, not for not, I mean, New York is obviously going to have a lot more people. So, right. You know, but percentages, it is actually the gayest place. I mean, we live in a little gated community and probably 75%, if not more right. are gay couples. So we, it's kind of a bubble that we get used to and we don't even think about it so much, but yeah. Do you, do you think people are friendlier here? Because, I mean, I lived in Seattle forever, and you talk about the Seattle freeze, whether you're trying to date or just meet people, and they kind of, you know, they're in cliques and some... I mean, it's, that, that's it's a, a real thing. thing. Yeah. It is a real thing. But how does that compare down here? Well, there are a lot of people from Seattle here, <laughs> and and they bring with them the same kind of issues that you ran into in Seattle, where and people are superficially friendly, and then... You try to take it a little further, and it's more difficult. I don't find that so much here. I think people are here to relax. I think, uh, as we mentioned, that it's a very gay population. It's a much. It's also a much older population. Uh, that can't be denied. So a lot of people here are retired. They're relaxed. They're kind of in permanent vacation mode. So. I think that people are a little bit happier overall. So I think I found a lot. I found it pretty easy to make friends and and, uh, people to hang out with. I just think that people are a little more, I don't know if I want to say genuine, but it's just easier to connect with them. And if you, you know, if you, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It's okay. I mean, I'm at a point in life where, you know, we have several couples that we're friends with and I don't know that I want that many more people in my life. I used to feel like, oh, I want to have more friends and we want to make more friends, want to make more friends. And for the first time, I'm kind of like, eh, you know, (laughs) I don't don't know that I want to be your friend because I'm pretty Well, well, I have almost 5,000 close friends on Facebook. Me too. And I have to buy all those people cards. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. But what's on your agenda now? What's, uh, What's coming up? Well, I'm probably a little over halfway through my current novel that I'm writing. Have you picked a name on that yet? Right now it's called Be Mine and I'm not so sure I like that. It's about um, two thirteen. It opens in 1986 with two 13 year old boys who are just exploring their sexuality and falling in love with each other in, in a small town. And um, one of them is abducted and then we flash forward to present day, and the abducted boy has never been found, And um, but he shows up at the door of the person that he was in love with back in the 1980s. Wow. <laughs> is it really him, or is it someone pretending to be him? Certainly upsets the apple cart of the, the stationary person who, who survived the right. abduction. Is the person that stayed... Is he married or yes. with somebody or something? Or he is with somebody, but okay. it's it's not a good situation. Okay, and there's a kind of twist to that because he disappears shortly after the so-called abductee comes into the picture. Wow, that sounds like a couple of twists there. <laughs> yes, yeah. All right. 
and I usually end these with, so you've lived a good part of your life. What lessons have you learned? What do you go by? What do you live by? It's better to be kind than to be right. That's a big one. I think uh, selfishness is probably something I try not to be, and I, and it's probably a pet peeve of mine in seeing other people. And just realizing two things. Everything changes, and nothing is perfect. Mm. And if you accept those two things, you're far ahead. And it seems like you're going to save yourself a lot of stress <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> by going with that. Well, yeah. I think when you're younger, especially, yeah. you think things are going to last forever. You think, you know, there's this perfection you can reach. And it's pointless to try for it. And it's, it's just going to hurt you in the long run. And you have to realize that everything you love or everything you hate is going to go away someday. Something to think about there. <laughs> I'm going to buy that book. Okay, good. I'm ordering it. In fact, I was looking just before uh, you came, and I think I can get it by Thursday if I hurry up. <laughs> yeah. And this is Tuesday when we're recording this. So, all right, I'll let you know what I think when I read it. Okay, I would like that. Sounds great. And thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me.